Welcome to the Korean Now Podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show we have David Tizard. David is a professor at Iba Women's University in Seoul, a PhD candidate, and a columnist for the Korea Times. And he has also been building up a significant amount of research recently around the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche and how this applies to Korea and Koreans. Now from the outside, this might sound like a strange direction for Korea-based research. But as with so much of Nietzsche's work, it has considerably broader reach than people first imagine. And though some of these ideas may seem complex at first, abstract even, once David drills into them and opens up their significance, their import for Korean society becomes apparent. Nietzschean ideas such as returnal occurrence, the prospect of living one life again and again and again, and then looking at the significance of that cycle on the individual and just how they would see it themselves. To metamorphosis, the stages in development and the questions of character of who we are fundamentally, and importantly, who and what we can become. The concept of the will to power, Nietzsche's idea of how great minds drag us forward in the world, but also, more importantly, how we see ourselves, the act of becoming who we are, and just what it is we should be valuing in ourselves and in society around us. And then, of course, which most people will be aware of, questions about religion, or more importantly, the death of God, as Nietzsche put it. And for Nietzsche, of course, this wasn't so much a question about religion, but more a pointed look at people who he saw as failing to develop their own values. People who, in his mind, did not recognize the magnitude of where they were and what they had become. And therefore, despite their important place in history, were still looking backwards to tradition and the old values of society, and hoping in some way that they would still reanimate them. But inside Nietzsche, most of all, there's hope. In many ways, he is seen today as the philosopher of nihilism, the great predictor of the calamities of the 20th century. But he was a diagnostician, not an advocate. He said nihilism and postmodernism of this kind would be a result if we didn't seize the moment, embrace his philosophy, and embrace ourselves. Which of course turns the question over to Korea and Koreans themselves. From each of these philosophical points, David will open up new aspects and new questions on Korean society. The place for sex and abortion and the strained dichotomy that Korean society finds itself in, in this and a number of other ways, where they engage in a certain behavior without compunction, but yet insist on a public face that claims the opposite. In many ways, a denial of self, a denial of their modern identity, and a denial of what they want in the world, with all the strains and oppression and suffering and psychological regression that comes along with this. In this same vein, gay rights comes up in this discussion. Korea is a society whose gay rights movement is incredibly embryonic. It is there, it is growing, but there is no political party today, at least no major political movement, that openly champions these rights. And in many ways, it is a society that looks on this issue as once again something that shouldn't be spoken about. A nuisance of sorts. And all this despite the fact that Korea, just as with everywhere else in the world, has a thriving gay community and is also feeling the push from outside movements and outside countries to change their law and their social organization to match a new global ethic in this regard. And then race becomes a big question in this podcast. The question of outside values, outside races, outside ethnicities. For anyone that has ever been to Korea, this is an incredibly welcoming society for any foreign arrivals. You could live a life here and not notice any overt racism whatsoever. But there is an undercurrent below this. An atavistic idea about Han Min Jok, about the pure Korean bloodline. And this doesn't just animate people's lives, but it animates politics and foreign policy such as that towards North Korea. And it creates a country that in every way possible is seeking international cooperation, friendship, trade and alliances, and wants to be an international hub like Hong Kong, and yet is uneasy about what that reality will bring to the country. From there we move on to questions of offence, the importance of keeping face, and the creation of Korean icons like BTS. And this transitions neatly into a question about K-pop, what this modern music phenomenon says about Koreans today, how it is seen inside the country, and the protective way in which many people see this as a symbol of Korea itself. Now there is also a lot more here to get through. We talk about colonization, demonstrations, coups, military dictatorships, the crushing of youth culture, the chaebol, capitalism, conservatism. And we do try to blend this together as neatly as possible. But for people listening who want to get a deeper look, I'm going to link below this podcast a series of articles that David has written for the Korean Times and the permanent link from where you can find future articles by David. He is quite a prolific writer and his works are always provocative and always asking questions about Korea and their place in the world. 
Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider donating to the Patreon account or the PayPal link attached below. Failing that, you can always share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. All this help is greatly appreciated. On that, and to talk us through Nietzsche, Korea, and social change, this is David Tizard. David Tizard, thanks for coming on the Korean Now podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. So today is an interesting topic, to say the least. It's one that I've always been interested in. A lot of people who are not so much trained uh, philosophers themselves are always interested in this. And this is Frederick Nietzsche and uh, mm -hmm. some of his ideas and the social concerns he has and how they apply to Korea. And this is, uh, as soon as I bumped into your work on this, I thought I have to get him on the podcast. This is one of those really fascinating parts of the world and parts of philosophy. So yeah. just to kick things off here, just to give people an overview of where we're going here, uh, who are we talking about? Who is Frederick Nietzsche in a very um, brief oversight? I think Frederick Nietzsche can, he can change his identity according to how you look at him. He's, to some people, he's a philosopher. To other people, he's more of a literary figure or a poet, a composer. And to other people, he might be a, a cultural critic for some people, his work centers around existentialism, the idea of the self, consciousness, where other people approach him as being a forebearer, perhaps, of postmodernism, poststructuralism. So he's really kind of this all encompassing figure. And he's fascinating because he's so hard to get a grip on. And I found reading him, and his work is very literary in style. It's it's sometimes a stream of consciousness, uh, expounding on various ideas in a literary way. It's it's very interesting to read him, but then more interesting, I believe, to discuss him. So his ideas coming at sort of the beginning, uh, from about 1844 he was born, died 1900. So he was really in this transitional stage, and I think he really signaled what was coming in Europe and a lot of people have credited him for foreshadowing, foreseeing what was going to happen in terms of nihilism and a lot of the horrors of the 20th century with his uh, famed affirmation of the death of God. So he's he's everything and nothing at the same time, Nietzsche. I know that's not really an answer, but he, he remains a figure of mystery to to me and many others, I feel. No, that's a, that's actually a decent introduction. That's quite good. I mean, he is he has that re deep bombastic style, and he is really hard. He's quite yes. a slippery person to pin down here. But just one other thing about Nietzsche here: um, he is a Western philosopher. He is a German philosopher, mm -hmm. and today we're going to try in some way to apply his ideas to Korea. And uh, as you mentioned there, one of the big things that he is made for, and we're going to get into this a lot deeper later on, is the death mm -hmm. of God. And the death of God, what he's really talking about, of course is the destruction of old values, as in we need to recreate new values. And I wonder yeah. just how you found fitting someone like Nietzsche into the Korean setting where um, tradition and uh, history and culture is such an important uh, continuance. Well, I did a lot of work during my master's degree on Asian religions. Um, so I was quite interested in Taoism specifically, but then also elements of Buddhism and Hinduism. And looking at Nietzsche, Nietzsche did have uh, Taoist and Buddhist texts. It was seen. He had one of each, I believe, in his uh, in his library. And there is a, a wonderful quote by the Japanese author Natsumi Soseki, who said upon reading Nietzsche that although it comes from a Western man, the ideas here are very much Asian. So, yes, in terms of identity, Nietzsche was uh, established or he was situated, sorry, in the middle of Europe, just when it was about to explode in the 20th century. But <clears throat> there's definitely an element of Eastern application that can be applied. So I found it really interesting. I often contrast Nietzsche with the work of uh, Yugil Jun, who is a Korean uh, philosopher thinker who was influenced by Fukuzawa Yukichi. And discussing it with my undergrads, it often comes to us that Nietzsche at times seems more Asian and the the Asian person, Yu Gil Jun, often seems more Western. So the application of his thought to, to Korea has always seemed pretty appropriate and it's never been uh, it's never clashed really with what I've been trying to do. 
And uh, let's begin to open this up into the Korean context and touch on some yeah. of the social issues that you've touched on there. So one of the, e- I suppose, the easiest ways to get into this and one that you've written about yourselves, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link this below here so people should go and read the articles themselves, is this idea of uh, returnal occurrence, this idea, yeah. and I'll, I'll get you to explain it, but it's one of those things that often people, if they're not touched on Nietzsche, they have an idea that Nietzsche said something about this. So I might get to open that idea up first, and then we can expand that into some uh, Korean social concerns? Sure. Well, um, eternal reoccurrence is an idea of Nietzsche's that was probably best expressed in his work, Thus Spake Zarathustra. And it first seems kind of a, a difficult idea, but one of the easiest ways to explain it, uh, slightly quoting Nietzsche here, is to say, suppose that in your loneliest loneliness, a little gnawing demon creeps into your heart, and he says to you, you have to live this whole life forever again with every pain and sorrow and joy and thought and sight over and over again in the endless permutations of the world the sand glass of existence will be turned over and you with it you speck of dust now how would you reply to that demon would you curse him or has there been a moment in your life so great that it redeemed everything else and you would answer you are a god i've never heard anything so divine so so you have this little gnawing demon that comes to you and, and presents a thought experiment. The life that you've lived up until now, of course, life is suffering and life is joy and life is everything in between on this spectrum of existence that we go through. But would you do it all again is the question. Has there been something so good, so powerful that you would take everything else with it and come? So that's the point in time that it demarks. But it's also a thought experiment that is meant to transform your life following that. So once you understand this idea that imagine you would have to live your whole life again. And I spoke briefly about the Eastern idea. That's that sort of wheel of samsara that keeps turning round and you're locked into it until you're able to see through the mire or the illusion of time. So but. It's meant to transform you as if to say, from now, I'm going to live my life with no regrets and fully engaging in everything. So if I did have to live it again, I would be completely happy with it. And this is kind of the way where you break from traditional, I believe, monotheistic ideas that present to you topics such as eternal paradise or heaven, because in these ideas, for better or for worse, you're encouraged to sacrifice pleasures in the here and now for a future salvation, for a future ecstasy, for a future nirvana, if you will. But Nietzsche's saying, no, you have to live it now. And that's the Dionysian side of him coming through. So this is wonderfully expressed in Uh, Some of his later work, Eke Homo, where he was kind of perhaps losing the threads of reality. But in Eke Homo, he had chapters entitled uh, as Why I'm So Great, Why I'm Such a Great Writer. So it seemed he had adopted that himself. He was finally seeing that life was something that we should live and we should embrace and that we should not regret the things that we do. And therefore, that which doesn't kill you only serves to make you stronger. So that's the basic idea. Has your existence up to now been pleasurable enough that you would do it all again? When I was reading that, of course, I first applied it to myself and went through all the different uh, thought experiments. But then I thought it would be interesting to apply it to Korea as a nation. Now, we know Korea as a nation has had all its ups and downs. We look at the the beginning of the 20th century with the colonization or the arrival of the imperial powers, whether it's uh, Russia, Japan, or countries from the West, we look at the taking away of their language, the the names that they were allowed to use of each other, the difficult approach with uh, sort of forced labor, comfort women. We then look into the uh, 1960s or authoritarian rule under Lee Seung-man, later with Park Chang-hee, Chun Do-won, Gwangju. And then we look at the modern Korea with its 5G internet connections, with its more modern approaches to topics such as uh, abortion, homosexuality. We look at remarkable economic transformation. 
we see it's a country that doesn't really experience much in the way of uh, terrorism or, or excessively violent crime. We look at the soft culture of BTS, uh, Son Hung Min, recently at the Cannes Film Festival, Bong Joon Ho, with his marvelous film Parasite, uh, Gi Seng Chung. And we say if Korea had to look back on everything, including the, the various dynasties, which I don't mean to ignore, the Joseon, Goguryeo, etc., would it do it all again? Would South Korea go through all this up to 2019 and say, yeah, we're happy with how things have gone? Of course, there have been some sadnesses, but, you know, this hand that they often speak about, which came about during the uh, colonization period, this sense uh, uh, of resentment, sorrow that defines their existence, would South Korea do it all again? Or would it want to rewrite history so that it came out uh, differently? And if it were to, how would it rewrite it? I found this question interesting and it, I knew it was a good question because it divided people in their answers. So that is a, an interesting way to begin to look at Korean question. And I, I, it's, good, it's good that you brought in the question of Han there at the end because, of course, Nietzsche, mm -hmm. in many ways, is well, someone who values suffering, not in itself, but it, it, he believes, of course, that no great things can be achieved without suffering. And right. and it is hard to look at the Korean experience in that way because, as you mentioned, Han there, it is a look uh, not just at the suffering of the Korean people, but in many ways a longing and a wishing that it hadn't happened. The, the, the colonial periods often look back as lost years and things like this. Mm -hmm. So from yes. that little history of giving give me there, I might open up a, a topic here. So let's, if you may, right. let's talk about abortion because, and I suppose in some ways, sex, uh, these sort of... Sort of um, I suppose challenging issues inside Korea today, but mm -hmm. it gives an insight into, I suppose, the sort of stuck place they find themselves in, as in whether or not they are welcome and willing, in what Nietzsche might say, to become themselves and recognize who they are in this way. So um, let's open up the the abortion issue. So as mm -hmm. far as I'm aware, abortion is still criminalized inside South Korea, though there is a, mm. a, a legal ruling on that, which will have to change that at some point. But oh, yes. but it's a country that has, like in many things it has, uh, it's criminalized something that people use regularly all the time. So in many ways, it's right. a bit like uh, pornography as well in that sense. It's criminalized yes. and everybody uses it and everyone knows that they do and they're kind of stuck in it. So um, it might get open up this question of abortion, which you've written about, and uh, we'll see where we go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the abortion one, that was um, the government now has until 2020 to legalize uh, something. It's been declared unconstitutional. And this recent decision came about because of uh, women activists or women just declaring that they need this as well as men. But there was also a push from the doctors who were saying that they were unwilling to continue breaking the law and risk their careers if it was going to be illegal. So there were doctors that were having to do these procedures for various reasons, and they were risking their careers. So as well as being a social issue, uh, as well as being a cultural issue tied into sex and gender, it was also a legal issue for those engaged in the practice from a medicinal uh, perspective with their Hippocratic oaths. More broadly, the issue of abortion is a difficult one because South Korea, you, you talked about this already, this idea that pornography is illegal here, prostitution is illegal here, and yet, you know, it can be seen in various places with uh, room salons and the spinning barbershop pole uh, bars. They're decreasing in presence, but still there. And it's the same kind of thing with sex sometimes in Korea. So although it's an uncomfortable subject, Traditionally, Korea is seen to be in a rather conservative culture in this regard. That's the Confucian influence, but that's also where in the West it was going through a, you know, this 1960s hippie sexual revolution, the flower power. What you had in South Korea, uh, conversely, was Park Chung-hee's government measuring skirt lengths and measuring male hair lengths. So now this conservative attitude is facing this uh, cognitive dissonance when people are being presented with these images of idols on the screen now doing sort of the very provocative dances dressed uh, often scantily clad and so Korea has to sort of look at 
it's attitudes towards sex in general, I believe. There, there's been this thing that's come up in the, the gender conflict with websites such as WOMAD and Megalia advocating things like a womb protest or Black Fridays and Black Sundays where they abstain from sex in order to bring about social change. So sex is, in Korea, it's, it's not just an act between two people anymore. It seems to be a political or a cultural phenomenon that's being used to change society. It's, it's also an interesting question asking whether to be anti-abortion or pro-life, how you frame that is very interesting. Is it a legitimate position to hold to be pro-life in 2019? Looking at some of my undergrads, and I, I, I teach at Seoul Women's University, so I have a, a broad uh, female uh, consensus there, or a collection of opinions, they don't all agree on abortion. And I always try to uh, lecture in such a way that the students are unaware of my position, that they will leave having more questions than answers, that they will sit down and think, well, what does David think about this? And what I've learned from them is that while there are a great many young Korean youth that support abortion, there are also those that say it's going to have neg negative effects regards attitudes to casual sex, regards to attitudes with sexual disease and things like this. So I think it's a question that needs to be brought out into the open a little bit more. Instead of it taking place um, as a taboo thing or something that, you know, is difficult for people to look at, you've got sort of only 2.5% of the female population on the con contraceptive pill. Sex education is generally lacking in many ways. And... 13 years that it's been permissible to have condom advertisements on the television, I believe only two of them have really aired. So I think the abortion question for South Korean people to address is a very important one, but it's one that needs to be done in a mature way and it needs to be brought out into the open a bit more. Not in a degenerate way where everything becomes permissible straight away, but in a way in which the lawmakers, the politicians and the people can uh, talk to each other in a you know a rational and reasoned manner, and from them, from then find the answer that is best applicable for the country and its citizens. So uh, let's move on to uh, the, another idea here and another thing. And for some ways, yeah. I know this is a little scattered, and I want to ask a lot of questions there, but there's so much to get through. So that uh, please forgive me, listeners, and please forgive me, David. Here, um, let's move on to the idea of uh, metamorphosis. This idea of okay. niches and uh, yes. of cam camel, lion, and the child. It's, so if right. we touched on an idea before of eternal recurrence and the idea of whether or not you are going to be happy with your life consistently over and over again, that's how much you embrace it, that's how much you embrace who you are and what you become. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an idea that for many people they may be a little bit more unfamiliar with. So I might get you to yes. open this one up for us. Okay, so uh, the three stages of life, this kind of metamorphosis, it's uh, you know, what maybe Kafka was going on about a little bit later, but the camel, the lion and the child, there are three stages of life which Nietzsche sees people in going through. So the camel is when you are a load bearing animal and you your identity or your character is determined by how much of a load, how much of a weight you are willing to bear without challenging anything. So you essentially become a servile a docile thing and this is the first stage of existence you might see this as a a feudal existence where you live under rules and you don't sort of challenge anything in a Weberian Max Weber sense it's the traditional idea and so countries that don't question things don't address things would be considered a camel from the camel comes the lion now, the lion has the ability to inflict damage. The lion is a dangerous creature. And what the lion is able to do is the lion is able to kill the dragon. And for Nietzsche, the dragon was the rules of society, the, the morality, the Freudian superego, these uh, angels and devils that pop out of our uh, heads in this cartoon fashion. This was the dragon, and we're often, we, we often do things in a Pavlovian way without questioning, without 
uh, really considering in a reflective manner, are the rules right? Is this what we should be doing? Now, as a lion, you're able to destroy those rules. Nietzsche calls them the thou shalts, these commands that you do unquestionably. But as a lion, even though you're able to overcome these rules, you still feel a sense of longing, a sense of association, because essentially they're your culture. Essentially, they are your ancestors. They're the words and deeds of the many people that have come before you. So while the lion is able to defeat the thou shalts, the commands, the rules of society, it still hasn't evolved because it still feels attached to them in some way. And therefore, the final one is the child for Nietzsche. So it actually becomes human instead of just using these animalistic actual animals. But the final stage of the metamorphosis is a child where you say yes to things. And again, this is similar to the eternal recurrence, but everything becomes a yes. Everything becomes a I will do things that I see and I will embrace them. And I will not live in a sense of fear or regret or load bearing. So just to recap the idea of Nietzsche's, there are three points. You go from the camel, which is a load bearing slave, servile way, then to the lion, which is able to see the rules and understand that they are rules imposed on you, not always for your best interests, until finally you're able to break free and just live according to your own instincts. So that is a sorry. That is yes. a, a very good segue here into yeah. the gay rights issue. In many ways, right. I think so. This is a fascinating one for people who are new to Korea or are not inside Korea. So, in many ways, mm. Korea is a very open and welcoming country. Everyone's incredibly nice, and but the gay rights yes. issue doesn't get much play here. And just to give people a small understanding of this, and this is something you've mentioned in your article on gay rights I have before me, is that mm. Moon Jae-in, who is the left-leaning candidate in the country, he's now the president. Yeah. Uh, even when he is running for presidency, he's asked a question how he thinks about gay rights in the country, and he says he's opposed to it. Now he goes yes. on to clarify that a little bit, make it a bit nicer. But when he says I'm opposed to it, he's not saying I'm opposed to gay marriage. He says I'm opposed to homosexuality as a principle. And this is yep. the left-leaning candidate in the country. So there really is no gay rights movement in Korea. They still have parades and protests. Uh, sorry, a protest was a slip of the tongue there because there's more mm. protesters out when these parades happen than there are protesters often. So uh, this is one of those issues where Korea is really clashing with itself and, and in some ways struggling with an idea that its values are changing and, and uh, maybe it needs to tear down some of the old fabric of its old society. It definitely needs to discuss it more. And yes, Moon Jae-in, uh, President Moon, is the sort of more progressive. He's the left-leaning thing. But sometimes those that left and right doesn't really fit into the Western understanding of left and right politics where, you know, the right would be the conservative or the Republicans and the left would be the Labour or the Democrats in terms of social issues that doesn't really always fit the, the South Korean matrix of politics. But yeah, I mean, President Moon was a former human rights lawyer, but in the debates, he said he was opposed to homosexuality. And, and so if the president is not gonna do that, then then who will? We, we learned from Taiwan that the people of Taiwan were actually opposed to embracing gay marriage. It wasn't a popular public decision. However, it was done because it was deemed to be in accordance with human rights, with the basic uh, pride or the, uh, the principle of things. And so it wasn't a populist decision in Taiwan. I, I found that very interesting that even though it is greatly opposed, the lawmakers still said, we have to do this on the basic principle. In South Korea, one wonders whether things still become a little bit populist, whether uh, lawmakers and politicians won't approach it because they're thinking about their own political careers, what it might do for their party. And, you know, the two parties are, of course, diametrically opposed, basically on the North Korean issue, if nothing else, and the economy is coming into it. But it, I think it really does need to start changing. I, I arrived first in 2005 and in that era, it was a very taboo subject. There were, you know, according to popular folklore, there were no gays in South Korea. And if you typed in, 
HIV or AIDS into your old mobile phone dictionary, it would give you things like the gay plague. And, you know, it permeated through society and um, with their with their celebrity, Hong Sok Chon, on television, he was removed from television for being gay. And he apologized for that. Now he claims himself as the country's number one gay. And that that to me doesn't really help the situation. I mean, I grew up with people seeing them around me, whether it was Stephen Fry, George Michael, Graham Norton, Sue Perkins, Ian McKellen, but they weren't gay. They were just well achieving celebrities in their various fields that just happened to have a different sexual identification. And so it's been interesting in Korea. You're, you're right to point out the uh, the gay pride movements and they've been held in, in Seoul, also down in Daegu. And the opposition to them is getting less. You're seeing, I believe, less conflicts there. From recent reports, I've learned that they're losing money, uh, actually, and, and that's a problem for them. But one interesting point has been that the embassies have been supporting them so the british embassy has been there with their message of love is great you've also had the danish norwegian canadian swedish new zealand american dutch mexican they've all been there supporting this movement that says we need to respect the lives of minorities but the south korean government hasn't been there yet so the South Korean government, what does it do? Does it take a populist way and it, it goes with what the majority of the people want? Or does it look at the constitution like it did with abortion and say that we need to approach it this way? And again, from my experience, there's no unanimous answer to this question. It is something that South Korea needs to look at. And it is looking at it slowly, but what it does with this, it will be very interesting to see. Yes, very much a country struggling with those phases of metamorphosis there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Let, yeah, let's, um, let's push on to one issue that everyone knows about, whether you're a philosopher, whether or not you paid attention, whether or not you've read much in your life, this is something everyone right. knows about, and this is Nietzsche is the philosopher of the, get, of the death of God. Now, of course, yeah. he wasn't the first person to say this, he wasn't by any means the first atheist, but he popularized this in a way that no one else had done so before, and mm -hmm. he put a new slant on it as well. So, uh, I might get to open up Nietzsche in this way, and then we can bring in some of the social issues around that as well. God is Dead is a fascinating thing, because it just sounds so powerful. I mean, linguistically, God cannot die if, the, if it's this omnipresent, omniscient being, omnipotent being, it, it cannot literally die. But for Nietzsche to say God is dead, I think most people, when they hear it, you know, it, it strikes them as a very quizzical phrase. But what does he mean by it? And is it something that he supports? God is dead. What Nietzsche was talking about was not really the death of a personal uh, sky being or, or however it might be phrased, he was talking about the death of universal rules, the death of um, an established truth that is always followed. And this is where Nietzsche sort of ties in with postmodernism, where uh, truths can become individual truths. And whether that's good or bad for a society also needs to be analyzed, I think. But for the death of God, it's not so much seen as in an atheistic way. But again, I see it more in a Max Weber way in terms of a society goes from being a traditional society living under the rule of a a king that is anointed by god or anointed by rule of birth into a more modern society which then questions the rules in front of it so god is dead that's how nietzsche sees it but for south koreans who is god and what is god i mean is god korean culture is god the confucian approach i mean where is God in South Korean society? What is God to the South Koreans? Because Christianity arrived obviously much later with a lot of the Catholic and then Protestant missionaries that built the country up in terms of the Yonsei Severance Hospital with Mary Scranton in the, the Iwa uh, school giving these things to the people. So what is the God in Korean society? And is it is it being challenged? I think that's a really interesting question for people to think about. 
And uh, that idea of the death of God, it was uh, yeah. in many ways an attack on religious people themselves, not religion, but religious people who, despite having, sorry, sorry, former religious people who, despite having given away God, refused to change their own values, re re refused to reevaluate their own values, and they mm -hmm. refused to accept that the death of God came with the death of of those values and uh, there's another article here that I that I bumped into and of course this one I bumped into long before I had the idea of speaking to you on the podcast I had friends right. that were sending it to me these are foreign friends in Korea with children yep. born to Koreans and this is an article of yours called are you a half and it's the idea yes. of, of mixed race children and this really made an impact at least in the foreign community here as far as I could yep. see and uh, you ask a, in the middle of this article, is it time to remember who we are? Is it time to ask where we come from? And that is a little bit of what Nietzsche is on to here. This is a very taught kind of subject inside Korea. The idea mm. that they're incredibly welcoming in two foreigners in almost every aspect that, that, that you see. And yet there's also a lingering commitment underneath the scenes of all this. A commitment mm -hmm. towards the idea that we are one race, the Minjok, and we must remain so. Yeah. It's... An incredibly difficult one. This idea of half, I mean, that also ties back with Nietzsche in, in terms of this Apollo and Dionysian sides to us, that we need to have two sides and embrace both of the sides, not just one to, to fully exist. Um, this article that I wrote, uh, it was entitled, Are You a Halfie? And, and the term was taken through uh, from a project that is being done by Becky White. Becky White worked, uh, we worked on radio together for the program a little of a lot where we explored cultural issues and and becky herself comes from mixed heritage half american half korean and so she wanted to help other people explore this where you know it's one foot in the culture and one foot not in the culture and how do korean people deal with it and I got a lot of blowback from this uh, article, it must be said, because many people wrote and said that it's great that these people are being given the voice and thank you for sharing this because it wasn't really seen that much um, in television. You know, you sometimes have the white foreigners or, or, or you have the others and you see in the programs where they sit around discussing things that there needs to be, like with the homosexuality issue or the LGBTQ issues, there needs to be an acknowledgement of this part of society because it's there, but it's not being looked at. And so many people were, were thankful for that. But then, of course, many other people said that, how dare I use such a term in my articles and, you know, not being a half in myself, I'm not allowed to do it. It, it wasn't my term. It, it was Becky's term. And I was writing about that. But can Korea get away from this Han Minjok that you looked at and it, it seems to be very difficult because from what I'm seeing there it seems there looks to be a resurgence of nationalism and I'm not sure that this nationalism is based as much as it is on ethnicity. Um, I do know that when President Moon went to the mass games in Pyongyang with Kim Jong-un he spoke about the Korean race as a people um, and that, you know, they have uh, certain qualities or characteristics. Now, that really, I don't think, would fly too much in Western liberal politics. I'm not saying that that's inherently better, but I think for a Western, the leader of a Western nation or a nation from the global north, whichever uh, title you might like to choose, for them to go to the people and talk about our race uh, doesn't seem to be in with the zeitgeist of the, the current times for better or for worse so we also have the trade issues with japan that are really dominating the news at the moment people refusing to buy japanese beers people cancelling their tickets to japan and so this nationalism i think is not going to help the halfy experience it's not going to help the people that are not a hundred percent korean and I think that what the country needs to do then is to define what is it to be Korean? Is Korean a passport? Is Korean a state of mind? Is Korean blood? Is Korean understanding Han or Jong? Or is Korean something more than that? Is being Korean a set of values? At the moment, I'm not sure how it answers that question, but I think a large majority of the country would say it was blood. And 
how does it go beyond that should it go beyond that is another question i mean maybe they've got it right maybe that's the answer i'm, I'm not going to say that i know how to uh, address all these questions but i think in terms of this half issue uh it needs to address what is it to be korean so whereas the eternal recurrence looked at is korea accepting of its past and the metamorphosis of the camel the lion and the child looked at in what stage of development is korea as a nation relative to other nations and also relative to itself i i think this one is asking just what is korea and how do you define what it is to be Korean? So that uh, is a very interesting insight there into just this idea that Koreans struggle with its own values to reevaluate itself, to to reclaim its own values in that way. Despite, I mean, for people uh, who haven't been to the country or are not familiar with it, street signs are written in, in English. There is English everywhere. Very welcome, very conscious of bringing in foreigners in many ways, but yeah. struggling with the impact of foreigners when they come. Um, Let's push on. I mean, so that's only going to change. Sorry, that's go. only going to increase, though. I I think with the sort of the, one of the lowest birth rates in the OECD, and and with the exacerbated gender wars and people seeking, whether it's the women often seeking uh, different partners from abroad and the men, especially in the countryside, by dint of the scenario having to, well, not having to, but then sort of being pushed or promoted to to keep the fertility rate up by governments or non-government organizations that's only going to increase and surely it would be better for the country to address that now before the situation exacerbates yes at some point it will have to if it wants to keep growing the way it has do what countries i'm australian I'm, yeah, you are british the countries like ours who have imported a lot of people over the years to keep the <laughs> the the productivity and also the diversity and the and the creativity up um, yes. Let, let's push on to a, a challenging issue now. Uh, this is one that uh, when Nietzsche is often a very misinterpreted philosopher, like you said here at the start, he's quite slippery in some ways. He's in yeah. some ways you can you clearly understand him and then you almost miss him entirely. It's just one of those things that's very hard to do. And one of the ways he was completely missed across history and of course very poorly so by the Nazi appropriators was the idea of the will to power. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's, uh, let's break that open here because this has got a couple of questions for the for interesting questions for Korean society. I, I, I must admit, sometimes I feel a little bit embarrassed trying to explain Nietzsche because it's not something that I fully understand myself, despite <laughs> having written and, and, and lectured on him a little bit. The will to power is particularly a difficult one because it was never really systematically uh, defined by Nietzsche and it, and it sort of needs to be interpreted and, and pulled apart. But the will to power is this idea i believe that everything has to exist and it has to exist as what it is so a stone has to exist as a stone and a, a fish has to exist as a fish and a, a tree has to exist as a tree and people have to exist as people and so this will to power is an expression of our existence and for the stone to exert this will of of power it has to express itself fundamentally as a stone not as anything else um and so as people our will to power we need to express we need to interpret our lives as human and then we need to look at what does it mean to be human well maybe to be human is to be that that child in the metamorphosis it's not to be a camel which serves uh, or lives under a load to be a you know a fundamental to be an, an overmensch or an ubermensch sorry uh, according to Nietzsche so the will to power is an expression and it's an expression of one's interpretation of one's existence that sounds very difficult but I think Nietzsche is trying to ask us to be human and to be more than human in this regard I don't know it's if you have any no, I, I, on how I to interpret the will of power. Can you help me out with this, Jess? <laughs> it, it, it is a challenging topic, and it often it gets blended in with that idea of the overman or the superman for many people, the yeah. idea of 
of yes, we 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 are bound with what we are. But he has this wonderful quote elsewhere at the top of my head. It's probably me paraphrased here, but all 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 great people, all great creatures produce their self overcoming, and I think it's it's that striving, not so much to not so it's it's often been misinterpreted as something just a motivational tool, get going, and the powerful mm-hmm. should dominate. But really, it's an idea to dominate yourself and to defeat yourself and become better than what you are in many ways. And um, at least from how I read it, it, it once again, Nietzsche is a notoriously difficult person to pin down. You get a bunch of people talking about him, all going to have very different ideas about what he is. Right. But from that perspective there, uh, Korea, this is one of those ones, this is one of those segues which seemed incredibly natural for me. Um, mm-hmm. Korea is is a society that has this poly poly culture, this, this fast moving society around us. Everything is yeah. about uh, capital development. Students are in school from dawn to dusk and they study all night at home. And there's this uh, idea people talk about, Hell Cho Sun, and it's the idea of the life that people have been. How, in many ways, forced upon them here, and I wonder mm. how you see this, and, and in in the and in the light of this idea, this um, Korean stuck in this mode, this idea. In some ways, they are trying to better themselves and move on, and in some ways, they are stuck in the exactly the same mechanism of doing it, and they're missing a lot out in their lives as well at the same time. It's it, yeah, it's really difficult. Um, by the way, I, I really agree with your definition of the will to power how it's not a will to power over other people but it's something that is related to self-mastery and discipline and control of the internal sort of deep psychological forces that uh inflict us all um in terms of career with this it, it's caught between two things because like i said in with regard the nationalism and and there is a sense of nationalism here and again for better or for worse that that can manifest itself positively or negatively. But when you get this nationalism and this love of the traditional culture, that pulls deep conflict with with modern life sometimes. And so, you know, you have these values such as hyo, which is filial piety, dragging them in on one side, and then you have this sort of individual desire or this modern life, which is arisen with other neologisms. You have the Hon lifestyle, Hon Bab, the Hong Kong, to eat alone, to, to study alone, the Hon Su, to drink alone, pulling them in two different ways. So recently, I, I've been quite interested by the neologisms. You mentioned Hel Joson. Um, I've been told that I'm not allowed to use that term by some people. It's okay. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's an interesting topic. I will use it because it's there. <laughs> um, but I've been told by some Koreans that it's okay for them to use the term to describe their oppressive living conditions, but it would not be appropriate for me to use the term. So it's, I find that interesting because then it, it, it a term that they seek to define themselves you know it's a term that's used to separate them from the the sampal yuk generation the people that were in their 30s at university in the 80s and born in the 1960s that was their term but now the new generation has their own terms hey joson is one of them uh, another very controversial one has been hanam or the, the korean man which is a uh, derogatory term used towards them but a better one i found was sabasa sabasa and this came of um came from kabaka kabaka was case by case so it differs from case to case so koreans might tell you um it's case by case david but this has evolved now and it's evolved into sabasa which is saram by saram so what should we do about this what's the right answer now you're actually finding Korean people say that the answer is sabasa. And when this word comes out and the more it's used, you can see that the dragons of the Dao shouts, you can see that the South Koreans in that sense are becoming lions in that they're, they're saying, well, no, maybe I need to do it for myself. Maybe my answer is different from the other person's answer. And maybe we have to see a society of individuals rather than a society or a holistic or a collective society. So these neologisms coming out, and especially in regard to the will to power, can they express themselves? I, I think they're getting away from this 
uh, this idea that they have to follow the rules, that they live in a absolutely hierarchical, top-down situation. That's, you know, that's still there a, a, a little bit, but I, I think it's changing and the internet and the terms that are being used certainly give rise to this. There is uh, one interesting challenge to that, though, by the way. And yes. if if people thought we were on some dangerous topics before, the next two topics I'm going to bring up, I, I just assume must have got you in a little bit more hot water than the previous ones. Mm -hmm. So the idea of BTS and racism here. Um, yeah. So... Uh, if if we're talking about this idea of self overcoming and uh, the will to power and really becoming who you are, and as you said, the the younger generation perhaps being more willing to break away from the old hierarchical orders here, there is one mm -hmm. deep challenge inside South Korean society today that are perhaps some people don't see as a challenge, and that mm -hmm. is uh, libel laws and libel laws in this country. I'll get you to introduce them as well, but they're notoriously overbearing in some ways. In fact, you can be telling the yeah. truth and still be charged with defamation in this country. Um, yep. And I'm assuming it comes from old ideas about keeping face. And there's this moment which you've written about here where um, BTS, the big uh, Korean K-pop band at the moment, mm -hmm. were, I suppose, mocked, but in a deliberately humorous way. It wasn't malicious by an Australian TV channel. And the mm -hmm. uproar was <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, ferocity, to uh, say the least, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, the, the libel and defamation laws here, uh, they seem very strange to some people. So um, in in the penal code, you have articles 307 to 312, which give a number of regulations and protections uh, in regards to crimes against reputation, defamation through insult and the publication of false factual statements. So as you quite rightly said, Jed, you can be charged with a crime even though you said something true and, and that's a really uh really difficult thing to look at and i remember when the uh the kangnam yok uh situation the the tragic murder uh, of a female in kangnam station um in that situation they didn't release the the man's name once he was found guilty uh, because of the defamation laws initially as well so these are designed, you know, they might have been designed with nefarious or noble intents originally. Were they there to protect power or to to prevent gossip and, and things like this arising? We live in a world of fake news and we need to be careful with what we say because it can have huge ramifications on people that are susceptible to, to information. But yes, the, the laws here about that are very strong. And I was always told when I first arrived in Korea with regard to face, which you brought up, is that to lose face in South Korean society is disastrous, but to make somebody else lose face in South Korean society is unforgivable. So while your own reputation may suffer, to make somebody else have their reputation, their life suffer is unforgivable. And so I think when this Australian... Um, I lived in Australia uh, in, in Melbourne and Endeavour Hills for about three years growing up there. And I, I was a big fan of the television and things like that, but I haven't lived there for about 15 years. And it was this Channel 9 pop culture show, 20 to 1. It was the first I've seen of it. And they were counting down the world's biggest global trends in an ironic look. And number 18, it was BTS. And uh, British comedian uh, Jimmy Carr uh, said that when he first heard that something Korean had exploded in America, he was worried. And it's clearly a joke. And that sets the tone for the piece. It was playing on, I believe, people's stereotypes. It wasn't great comedy. It wasn't always very fun. It was sort of mainstream. You might say it's a bit lame. It wasn't cutting edge. And it was playing on sort of stereotypes. But I believe deep down that's what sometimes comedy does i mean I, I really like watching russell peter's comedy and he just takes every stereotype to the extreme and and, and manifest them and, and what it's meant to do is show you your own insecurities it's not always those people uh, the comedians or the people telling the jokes that are insecure they're trying to make you question your own attitudes a famous example is sacha baron cohen with his portrayals of of borat Ali G and, and Bruno, etc., and the dictator, that it's meant to make you at 
the racist people or it's meant to make you see that and so there was a lot of blowback from this the reason why i write um i i write to not inform other people but i write to try and inform myself and i i look at the the best criticisms criticisms that i get i think eventually become my own arguments and I, i'm generally willing to change on this one uh the bts racism many koreans will openly tell me in undergrad situations in in lectures and seminars that korea does have problems with race and, and that they see um some countries being superior to them in a, a sadejui way some countries being inferior to them and it's something that they have to sort of deal but every country has issues with racism that's natural but on this one with bts are you allowed to criticize bts it's difficult because now it seems bts are the face of korea i mean chong wade and president moon tweet about bts repeatedly on the internet and has a huge commercial following and so to in a niche in sense if i try to tie into that and interrupt this question up that it south korea has to be able to laugh at itself it has to be able to uh take the criticisms it has to be able to see these things and not regret it not see it as an attack on its identity uh however these approaches might come i know many people disagree with me but um i grew up with the the expression stick and stones will break my bones but names will never hurt me i think there's some value in that there's always value in our in our maxims and proverbs and for me south korea has to be able to laugh at itself a bit more it, it needs to be able to sort of shrug its shoulders and go yeah okay then yeah that's that and we'll take that many people disagreed with me uh many people accused me of being uh probably the the most uh stinging criticism that i received about this article was that i was a white cis male over 35 and so i had no uh right to my opinions and <laughs> th that's something to be considered but that was generally the argument presented to me rather than an argument against what i was saying or race so identity is really important and it's for koreans to sort out themselves but i think in terms of their own identity I think a little bit more self-deprecating attitude and a little bit less uh reference to face would be important. I'm writing about suicide this week and suicide is a huge uh social problem here. Although the numbers are slightly going down, uh it's a huge thing and suicide is often seen as a way to save face. Um there's a really famous or really popular drama going on at the moment called Bojagwan, which is chief of staff and it's like a, a Korean house of cards. the most virtuous character in this commit suicide in the latest episode because he's trying to save face and we we saw the tragic uh death of ex president no mu hyun uh who leaped from uh our rock in his hometown kim dae jung the ex president said of this that he 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 leaped from the rock to show his innocence to the people So there is this way where face is really important and it's good to retain propriety and image and, and that's a really good thing. When it's pushed to the extreme, you see that people are willing to sacrifice themselves, kill themselves or, or attack in order to save this face and I, I think it needs to address its identity a bit better. So that's uh as a final couple of questions here. That that's twist this yeah. through the other side of of that of that dimension here. Now you've touched on a few times the idea of the Dionysian or the Dionysian and this is Nietzsche uh, in not so much saying that we have to embrace our fun love and enjoyable wine drink inside but saying that we have mm. to do it because it's it's lost its its importance next to the reason in many ways he thought Socrates yeah. won the argument everyone accepted that we just follow our reasons and therefore the Dionysian needed a champion and Nietzsche was going to be that champion and um yeah. this might be a segue here and it comes from what we spoke about before the idea of the will to power here this idea of becoming a great success the great successful uh, self overcoming yourself becoming a great creator a great artist of sorts and this is going to mm. drag us into what i'm only going to assume is probably a most controversial article just based yeah. on the title called k-pop yeah. sucks and right. um 
I'm assuming this came with a bit of pushback, but uh, it's you analyzing the movement itself and the amount of, um, I suppose, adulation it's been getting, not just in South Korea, but all the way around the world and the comparison yeah. it's been getting. And it, um, I'll get you to open this up here, but in some ways it seems like your criticism here is very well founded and it's on the grounds that uh, this is not the great step in creativity and individual uh, enlightenment and progress mm -hmm. that people think it is. Yeah, so I did K-pop sucks, K-pop still sucks. There'll be a K-pop sucks part three coming up. <laughs> I, I think I might eventually turn it into a book. Um, just to be clear right from the off that it's not about the music itself because, you know, music is sub is subjective. And I teach courses in Hallyu, so I'm always having to listen to K-pop. And, and it's I, so I, sh I, I should music. interrupt here as well, just yeah. to give people an idea, just to give you some context. You are a musician yourself. So it's not like me criticizing music who got no grasp on it at all. You do have a solid grasp on the subject as well. Yeah, I, I've been a performing musician here for uh, over a decade and playing at various festivals with my bands and try to do my original music, which I know is not to everyone's taste. Um, I also taught, taught my niece the other day BTS's Boy With Love song on piano. So, you know, <laughs> I do try to go beyond my <laughs> stereotypes <laughs> as much as I can, be unpredictable. With, with K-pop sucks, um, people would come up to me in uh, conferences and meetings and they would sidle up to me and say, excuse me, are you K-pop sucks? And so it became my <laughs> moniker for a while and I was never really sure, should I say yes or no? Um, but the, the K-pop industry, to me, um, it seems like there are terms such as the slave contract where the the trainees, they work for these big three gatekeeping companies, whether it's SM, YG or, or JYP. And, you know, they're all embroiled in their own scandals now. YG has become known as Yakuk uh, mm -hmm. for the relation to all the drug issues that are going on. Um, but not drug issues like people taking acid or marijuana in a, in a Beatles or Grateful Dead-esque fashion to increase their creativity, if that is such a thing, but rather sort of date rape and uh, far more sinister attitudes. It's, you see, from a Nietzschean sense, you see the camels in the K-pop industry. You see people uh, living out this paradox where they're not allowed to date, they're not allowed to have sexual identity, and yet they present this sexy, provocative, Lolita-themed image. Um, Cube Entertainment, they released Hyuna and Idon from their record contracts because they were dating. So they wanted Hyuna to be sexy, they wanted Hyuna to be this uh, uh, figure of enticement for the males, and yet were she actually to do that herself, that was that was seen as being not permissible. Uh, the members of Twice, uh, JYP, CEO Park Jin Young, he put a dating ban on them so that they could concentrate on their training. Zico put a video on his SNS. He was singing and drinking, and they said, "You're not allowed to do that." So they are idols, uh, but they are they are false idols, and they live this very camel existence. And there is no Dionysus an aspect I don't feel to the uh, K-pop industry. Uh, I know it gives a lot of people some uh, joy. I'm a I'm little bit skeptical about BTS, whether they are just, you know, they, they came out and say that their work was influenced by Carl Jung and they're addressing the social issues and things like, like that. I mean, Soteji was addressing social issues back in 1992 when he debuted and talking about songs for people to come home, runaway children. I, I don't think they're really doing that much as, as much as might be professed. There have been a couple of articles. Um, James Turnbull has written about that the Lolita complex is designed to satisfy the men in the Korean military. That The, the K-pop idols are there. And Sai spoke about this on television, that people during military service, they had to stand by the TV. And as soon as these scantily clad sexy women came on, they would all run there because they were so deprived of... Uh, sexual agency so deprived of contact serving for two years in the military that it was designed to sedate them it was designed for that and elsewhere there have been some academic articles looked at that say that the level of k-pop uh, uh what would you call it the level of k-pop indulgence or how much money you spend on k-pop 
uh, is connected to a lessening of egalitarian attitudes and that it reinforces uh, it reinforces gender roles. And, and you'll see that a lot of the time uh, uh, the women are sexy, but the boys are not. I mean, could a boy band these days have a very macho image? A lot of them don't. They're going sort of the cute androgynous uh, way, which is, you know, harks back to Prince or David Bowie, Mark Bolan in the West. But I'm not sure that the K-pop industry is, is a sign of uh, modern Korea, personally. I, I think it's it's an iron cage. It's something that traps people in. And I don't think it has real good effects on society. Interestingly, teaching Hallyu uh, the past semester, um, I only had one BTS Army member in there, and that was an American. Most of the Korean students were at the undergrad level in their early 20s, not really interested in it. So that was quite eye opening for me. But I, I think it needs to change. I, I think our, I think the Korean music industry needs better. It needs something more than what is being presented, because it's not just shallow. It, it, it's not just imprisoning the people inside the industry, but it might even be having negative effects more broadly on society and with the gender, the sort of sexual images and coming up. Is that what we really need to rely on? Can we not write five, six minute songs? This might be a criticism aimed at the West more broadly as well. I mean, it might need to, might just be an example of the music level in general, but yeah, I'm not sure that the K-pop industry is a good thing at the moment. And uh, as a final question, just tinged in my ear there. Um, yeah. How much is this in your in your opinion here? How much is um uh how much does K-pop dominate the the, uh, the Korean industry here? Because Nietzsche, for all he was, as he was saying, was to get people to become great creators themselves and be so creative that they overcome themselves and everything around them. Yeah. So I, I I suppose from someone completely uninitiated with the music industry in any way, like myself, and I assume a lot of the listeners themselves, um, how much is this suffocating the rest of the scene? Because as you mentioned in the West and in other countries. There is, uh, I suppose, the same movement towards this superficial, repetitive type of music. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, it, there is diversions. There is different. There's a lot of different genres, and they come and they go and they grow. And you have constant creativity. It's not always good, but it is progress and change. So, how much is yeah. K-pop suffocating things in us? Uh, least creativity, in your opinion, here. We absolutely suffocate. I know music is generally cyclical, so. The, the the popular music of the time might uh, one time it might be sort of dance based or EDM based as the, the current moniker then it might be guitar based then it might be sort of uh, Latin based so it goes around in, in cycles but here the the K-pop nature is is suffocating and what's really interesting is most of the social issues are addressed what I found in in Korean hip hop. So Korean hip hop takes a lot of these issues uh, and discusses them. But of course, that doesn't get much play. Korean hip hop, you have these these rap programs on, on television, but that's sort of the mainstream nice rap. The the Korean rap, I mean, Sunny and Feminist and these songs coming out, which really get these issues head on and make people think about them and make people address them. They're not going to get really much play on television. They're not going to get play on Friday night or a Saturday night uh, in between Honja Sander or Anand Hyongnim. On those programs, you see the K-pop idols. So the K-pop idols are all encompassing. Um, some there was a movement towards sort of indie rock or punk rock out here. But then some of the bands that have been featured in that, I mean, Infamously, perhaps one of the bands, they uh, dropped their trousers on a live television performance. Um, another band, they've had their bass player sort of uh, have some trouble with marijuana issues. So you wonder how much those isolated incidents where that genre of music, not K-pop, was coming to the fore, whether those isolated music just saw the conservative side, push it back down and say you had your chance and, and we're not doing that. So if music is meant to challenge us in some way music is meant to say something and the the k in k-pop doesn't really seem korean to me you might find more k in k hip-hop that's more korean to me in korean cinema definitely more korean to me and just if i 
can compare to Korean cinema, which I do sometimes. Um, Park Chan-wook, the fantastic director and auteur, uh, did JSA and Old Boy, many others, Agashi, which uh, the film. He's openly stated that modernization in Korea came through uh, Japanese colon. I can't imagine a Korean pop idol ever saying that. And if they were to say something, anything like that, they would be ostracized from the industry. Um, Bong Joon-ho's films, Gi Seng Chung, Parasite, where it looks at social stratification and economic stratification. He, his work is fantastic and he's not afraid to speak his mind. And, and these two, they receive critical success abroad because what they provide is something Korean, something idiosyncratic, something that is not seen elsewhere. And when the world looks at these things, they receive the top honors in their field for, critically. In the K-pop industry, it receives a lot of commercial success. That's undeniable and more power to it. And I'm absolutely happy for them to, to sell out Wembley or for Blackpink to, to play at Coachella. That's great. But the cr critical success for presenting something Korean seems to be missing. So uh, I, I think it would nice, it'd be nice to hear Korean pop or Korean music a little bit more, because I, I don't see it there. I, I see something Kamal-esque. So that's a, a good spot to leave this on, I suppose. Um, Nietzsche, as oh. we've been talking about a lot today, has got a lot more complex stuff to him, a lot more depth, and a lot more stuff that you've written about and spoken about in a lecture that I've listened to as well. So I'm going to link as much as I can below this podcast for people to go and okay. read. Uh, a lot of David's articles are online. He writes regularly, and they're eminently readable. They're not turgid uh, academic literature that they struggle to get through. They are quite readable, quite accessible. So I do encourage people to go and read as much as they can at the bottom and I'm going to link it and uh, keep their eyes and ears out because he does publish regularly as well as he said uh, soon coming out another article about suicide which I will read mm -hmm. myself um, yes on that uh, David Tizard thanks for coming on the Korean Now podcast it's been an honor Jed thank you for having me on the Korean Now podcast I hope it does well and for anyone listening if you have any challenges criticism thoughts or about anything please do get in touch it's, it's meant to be a conversation and that's what i'm trying to promote at the moment so jed thank you for supporting that conversation and let's hope it continues